Welcome to Outside Sales Talk, where we meet with industry experts to learn the strategies and tactics that make them successful. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and I've helped thousands of salespeople all over the world crush their quota. Today, I'll help you crush yours. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. Today, I have David Knorr with us. We're going to be talking about using co-creation to develop better relationships and win bigger deals. Uh, David is a growth strategist, thought leader, and global keynote speaker on relationship economics. As a speaker, Nor examines relationships to drive uh, business growth. He has written about 10 books, and one of them is called Co-Create, How Your Business Will Profit from Innovative and Strategic Collaboration. David, welcome to the show. Hey, Steve. Uh, thanks for having me. It's good to be with you guys. Yeah, I'm really excited for to to uh, to hear your hear your thoughts here. What what inspired you to write uh, co-create? So, as you were kind enough to mention, co-create is actually book number ten uh, since 2008, and I work with a lot of different types of companies and across industries. And uh, somebody earlier today was asking me how long does it take you to write it, and you you start to identify a challenge within typically a company, right? So I do a lot of consulting and coaching and training and whatnot. And you start to wonder, is that a company issue? Is that an industry issue? Is that a leader issue? And as you, as you see the same set of challenges across multiple companies or multiple industries, the light bulb goes off of, I think this is more evergreen. And what I saw that really prompted the co-create uh, idea was um, companies, individuals, teams, and companies struggle to remain relevant. They were losing market share. They were not, and, and it starts very simple, right? The, the symptoms are people, you know, stop returning your calls and emails or your, you know, your, your attrition of your clients or it, your sales cycle suddenly be start to get longer. And what's happening is your, your value is not evolving to keep you relevant with the needs, with the ever-growing needs of that customer or the market you're trying to serve. And, and I saw that across multiple companies, multiple industries, multiple teams, and the light bulb went off. There has to be a better way. There has to be a different way. And that's where the idea came from. Excellent. And uh, so, sounds like my personal nightmare, right? Really? <laughs> <laughs> how, can, how, can, uh, how can outside salespeople use co-creation to avoid this and create better customer experiences? Sure. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remind your audience of something my dad drove into me, which is says, you know, he always drove into us that if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room, right? <laughs> so in 2019 and beyond, none of us have all the answers. So I think the days of any sales professional, any team walking in and telling a prospect or a client, you sit there, you be quiet. Let me tell you how smart we are. Let me tell you how great my stuff is. I think those days are numbered. With, with the plethora of access to information it, and all the data that I've read says that customer, that prospect knows more about your product and your services than, than you think they do. And, and it really is, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to change the conversation to we've done our homework. Here's what our perception is of not just where you are today, but where you're trying to head to. We don't have all the answers. What if we put our heads together and we kind of came up with that solution, came up with, you know, whatever that solution may be together. And the, the sooner sales individuals, sales people, sales organizations, um, and I'm saying this respectfully, figure out that it's not about them. It's about how that client, how that customer, how that prospect is better off because of them. And as such, not everything you sell on the truck is going to be relevant and viable to these people. Mm -hmm. the sooner they'll start to think about what if, what if I brought in this other entity with me that really created a, a, a stronger value add? What if I um, really combine my technology with somebody else's that gave them not just data, but actionable insights? What if my tires came with rims and the rims came with not just install, but rotation that created something beyond just what I do? And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, that's the real opportunity to drive, and we've proven, drive incredible growth if you stop being the hero of the journey and really start thinking as your customers or your prospect as really the hero of the journey and you as the guide to help them get there. Does that, does that make sense? Does that resonate? 
Yeah, it really does. So, so um, to paraphrase, co-creation is where you're you're looking to you're looking to ba- s- combine your product or service with other adjacent products or services to create a solution that brings more value to your customers than just your point salute, your point service or product could. Yes. And yes. And I don't mm-hmm. want you to just think of product service. I want you also to think of ideas or perspective, right? So I could bring a product or solution and, mm-hmm. and, and this probably has happened to some of your audience members, right? The customer's use of it is very different than what we thought they were going to do with it. Right. Or, or, they, they say, and they start to, my favorite ways is uh, when a customer or prospect gets up on a whiteboard and starts like drawing or writing, hey, what if you took your product and solution and we did this or we took it in there? And so it's not just product and solutions, it's also ideas and it's okay. perspectives and it's coming from a place of need. That's number one. Number two, most people think of it as just bilateral, just you and I, you're the prospect. I'm calling on you. It's just you and I putting the artists together. We actually believe in multi. So, so what if there's another department or a function or a partner or somebody completely out of our industry that has come up with a really unique way to solve a problem using us as part of that solution? Mm-hmm. And that's where we're finding some really exciting, really interesting ideas. So tell me, how can, how can these ideas, how can, how can co-creation help salespeople better understand their prospects? Love it. So I'm going to give you, your audience, three quick things. Number one, I talk about listen louder. Listen louder. It's amazing to me, Steve, that we listen with the intent to reply, not listen to really understand. And I, listen, I'm as excited about my products and services as anybody a really bad habit a lot of professional sales reps have is we interrupt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're trying to say. So let me get three steps ahead of you to tell you what, you know, let me finish your sentence, right? Mm -hmm. Stop it. That's not helping you, right? Just stop. So listen more intently. Listen for not just what they're trying to do, but why are they trying to do it? And I would submit to you that a lot of salespeople's prospects know what they want, not what they need. The difference is their consultative approach. The difference is salespeople asking much more intelligent, much more engaging, much more with the right audience. That's interesting. Tell me more about why are you trying to do that? Tell me what the outcome is, right? So listen much more intently. I say again, listen louder, number one. Number two, as quickly as you can, bring them in, give them permission, invite them in to the ultimate solution. So if you have a common mission, common vision, sometimes common enemy, like say over-regulation, the sooner I can get out of that sales mode and really bring them into, that's interesting, how would you do that? Or what would that look like? Or can you sketch that for me? Can you, like, can you, can we just draw that on back of a napkin of what would that look like? The sooner I do that, the more ownership we've seen prospects take in the ultimate solution you create together. And the last one is, um, you, you really got to um, stop thinking that you have all the answers and you have the solution going into it. If you become naturally inquisitive, if you start asking more questions, and I've always said, convey your credibility with the questions you ask, not necessarily the solutions you bring. So I love, and sales people call on me. I've, I've been in client scenarios where sales people have come and seen us. I love the ones that walk in And again, they're confident, they're capable, they're very knowledgeable. They earn your trust by asking uh, really interesting, really engaging questions that, and my favorite response is when the client says, that's interesting, I've never thought about it that way. I don't care what you're selling. If a prospect says, I've never thought about it that way, ding, 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 you've just created value that they haven't thought of. And that's how it can really help salespeople better prospect, better understand what the prospects are thinking and, and really create higher value sales, more profitable opportunities. That, that makes a tremendous amount of sense to me. Uh, how does that relate to building strategic relationships with, sure. you know, how, how can outside salespeople in particular better build strategic relationships with the concept of co-creation? Love it. So as I mentioned, uh, co-creators book number 10, book number one was relationship economics. So I've, I've been a student of business relationships almost for two decades. 
and I often talk about most of us, there's three types of relationships, right? Uh, personal, that's friends, buddies, we go skiing with, we go right cycling, whatever, right? Those are discretionary, we pick them. We're never sure how they fit into our professional lives. Functional relationships are people we put up with because we have to. Let's be honest, some of our customers, some of our colleagues, they may not be discretionary, but they're still safe in the context of our work together. Most people get those two. It's the last one they miss out on, which are really strategic relationships. Strategic relationships, by definition, elevate your thinking. They elevate your perspective. So think of that executive. Think of that business owner. Think of that business leader that can make one phone call and remove a whole bunch of obstacles from your path. Think of the person that can fast track your PO. Think of people that can accelerate your ability to get things done. And Steve, what I've learned over the years is if you throw enough time, effort, resources at almost any opportunity, eventually you'll get there. You're going to win it. You're going to lose it. It's just going to go away, right? One of the three. We believe co-creation. We believe this idea of inviting customers, partners, prospects, employees, investors, media. In the book, I think I talk about eight, 10 different types of relationships you have in the market into genuinely co-creating that solution, that opportunity. Uh, that path for you not only deepens that loyalty, but it also accelerates your elevation from, oh, good Lord, here's another sales guy that's just trying to sell us something, to demonstrating a vested interest in their success. What I've learned about relationships is you can't just talk about it. it, it, it and I actually tell a lot of sales teams, please stop asking people to trust you because they don't, Right? Trust, like relationships, has to be earned. You have to demonstrate that you have a vested interest in their success above and beyond your own products and services. Co-creation, we believe, is the fastest path, the more efficient path, uh, the most effective path to get there. In your book, you say co-creation is a transformational journey. Can you explain what this means? Sure. So if you think about why we, the purpose of building a relationship, uh, again, there's three. There's a reason. A reason is often a transaction, right? I sell you something or I do something for you and I get paid. That's a transaction, very episodic. There's a start and finish, we're done. Put several reasons together and now you get a season, right? We work, I love talking to salespeople who've been working with the same client or different people in that same client company for years, right? They've put several of these reasons together to get a season. Again, most salespeople get those two. Unfortunately, those are still very transactional. It's me selling you something else and it's a transaction, it's the next deal, it's the next deal on the pipeline, that's all transactional. Co-creation by definition is the third purpose in building a relationship, which is a lifetime. When you co-create a solution with somebody, so uh, uh, KPMG, if I can mention a name, has been a client of mine, a division of KPMG has been a client of mine for 10 years. I've worked with multiple people up, down, across multiple different groups, and it wasn't because of the transaction. Sure, the first time I spoke for them, uh, you know, I, I went to an event and I spoke at partners getting together around relationships to really help them build. That became then several projects, that became faculty in this director's leadership forum for five years that became coaching and mentoring several people. So now several partners who have retired from the firm are still not just good personal friends, but they're now investors in, in one of my companies and, and investors in a, in a fund. And so the relationship has gone full circle from a transaction. Here's, here's a product or service, a, a, a reason to now several reasons becoming a season of working together, to now we're genuinely co-creating a very different solution, a very different value that really points to that this is gonna be a lifetime. And in that lifetime, you you, both of you transform. You're very different people, you're very different objectives, and you become a big asset to one another. Great, great, great definition. Thanks for really refining that. Tell me, what is the difference to you between co-creation and collaboration? Love it. And it's a question that I'm glad you asked. It's, it's the, probably the single biggest question that I often get asked. If you think about uh, most collaboration, 
Steve, the number one reason it fails is actually lack of commitment. You have an agenda, I have an agenda, we'll pretend to kind of work together, but we really are following parallel paths, right? And when I'm kind of either bored with you or tired of this partnership or collaboration, I kind of go my separate ways and you're left hanging. Co-creation in that same visual, if your audience can think about it, is really for us to come together and really intertwine our success together. So it starts with a lighthouse. It starts with a common mission, common vision, or a common enemy. Think of overregulation, right? So that lighthouse draws us. It's not, nothing is pushing us. It's drawing us. It's a market opportunity. It's a competitor that we want, both want to fight. It's my product portfolio is stagnant. It is, I'm going into a new market and my only success, my best source of success, can I brute force it? Yes. Co-creation is all about finesse. Co-creation is all about, I'm going to reserve my energy. If any of your audiences, you know, exercise or I'm going to reserve my energy and leverage a, a vested interest through somebody else to get there. Another quick way I want you and your audience to think about it. I've always said collaboration for sake of collaboration is a waste of time collaboration to make that end result better, stronger, faster is priceless. So if the end result is dramatically better off, it's that intertwined success, not us running in parallel paths, if you will. So, uh, and that makes a tremendous amount of sense. I, I really like what you're saying here. What, what, can, uh, what can outside salespeople do to create exponential value uh, in this way from their competitors. And ah. do you have an example of how to do that? Just to turn sure. this around sure. that side. Yeah. So, so your audience would benefit from, if they dig into it, a, a, a really interesting point that I, that I talk about in the book, uh, and I didn't come up with it, um, it, it the idea of co-opetition. So co-opetition is all about one day I'm a head-on competitor with somebody. The next day, Actually, part of what we do and part of what they do works really well in this cooperative, in this co-created value creation, right? So I think the days of seeing competitors as black or white are numbered, if not gone. And, and um, it, you know, all kinds of examples of a uh, technology hardware company that uh, realizes that the hardware is a necessary evil what they really want to do is solve a business problem. So they work with not a systems integrator, not another software company, but an agency that is not going to sell the hardware, but that agency is going to solve the problem, which the hardware becomes an enabler of, right? That's an example of they're competing for that same dollar, but because they choose to work together, they, they really find success. Or you think of um, uh, a, a Lego, right? You know, we, we, I don't know about you. I grew up with Lego and it was boring and it was, you know, only a few sizes. And if, you've, if you haven't been to a Lego store lately, all the different themes, all the different parts and pieces they have, all the, right, all of that is co-created. Here's the interesting part. Um, you, most of you people have heard of hackathons. Think of a hackathon Lego style where they bring people in to create their own creation in a competitive environment and then they take the best ones and they create a theme out of it and package it and sell it, you know, system wide. So they're not coming up with all the ideas, right? A lot of their people are. MyStarbucksIdeas.com, 300,000 ideas of people that are consumers of, of that Starbucks value that created food and created wine nights and art nights at your local Starbucks and the little green stir that plugs up the hole so my coffee doesn't spill on me. So you got to stop seeing competitors black and white, really see opportunities for, is there an opportunity for co-opetition? I still am not going to show all my cards, right? But I'm willing to work with them in specific scenarios where our joint value, and that's the real key, is much stronger than either one of us trying to go out of the loan. Sure. If it creates customer value uh, to be cooperative, even if with a competitor, you can bring a superior solution that's going to, you know, generate that value. It makes total sense that you'd want to team up. Absolutely. Um, uh, it's critical. Absolutely. 
So how can sales managers work to prior, prioritize these co-creating collaborative interactions within their team? That's again, another great question. And at beyond the frontline contributors, I'm often asked, what can the management, what can the leadership do? I keep coming back to, again, Steve, three ideas. One, they have to model that behavior. If the manager is so egotistical that he or she says, listen, I don't need them, all right? We got this. I, we don't need to you know, screw those guys. We could do this ourselves. That's not really modeling. And you can't just talk about it, right? You got to model the right behaviors, which is listen, you know, check the ego at the door. Say, listen, there's a, there's a and I've always said, uh, side note, fundamental difference between confidence and arrogance is confidence says, I know a lot, but there's a lot more I can learn. Arrogance says, I know a lot and there's nothing new I can learn, right? So mm -hmm. I've always been more attracted to sales managers who are confident and not arrogant, right? That's number one. So model the right behavior. Number two, enable the sales team with the right tools, with the right resources, with the right training, with the right coaching and mentoring to lead with the relationship as the arrowhead, not the feathers at the tail end of the arrow. So if the sales team is leading with products or services, I would submit, again, today moving forward, that's the wrong approach. Let's lead with the relationship. Let's lead with the collaboration. Let's lead with, we've done our homework. Here's our perception. What do you think? And what if? And that's interesting. Tell me more. That's a, that's a relationship kind of lead, not, yeah, I'll get around to that after I get a PO, right? The third one is really celebrate it. Celebrate that success. We, you know, we ring the bong when, when somebody closes a deal or we have president's club and we have chairman's circle and we do all these things as sales incentives. I'm just not seeing as many of those celebrated successes because we listen because we collaborated, because we co-created, because we uh, didn't put our ego ahead of the needs of that client and we worked with, right? When was the last time you heard a success story of, of any company working with three, five, eight different players to really create that incredible value that none of them could have done there, could have gotten there by themselves. We just don't hear enough of those kinds of success stories within organizations because everybody's worried about, well, that's just going to extend my sales cycle. You don't get it. There is no sales cycle. If you don't change your mindset and attitude and approach in how you go into particularly B2B, more sophisticated enterprise accounts. I'm getting some fantastic notes here. I mean, these are, these are great thoughts. Um, I'd love to enter a, a quick fire around here where we, where I ask you questions that, uh, short questions with short, probably 60 second ish answers. Got it. Um, so first of all, what factors hold people back from becoming great at relationship building? Uh, they think it's yet something else to have to do like a checklist. That's a band aid. That's a patch in the fabric. You got to integrate relationships in everything you do. It has to become the dye in the fabric, the dye in your shirt, defines that that's a white shirt. The dye in my shirt shows you that there's a pattern that's integrated into it, not a patch that's going to be a afterthought. Right. Um, what is the first thing salespeople should do after meeting a new prospect? Send them personal handwritten notes. We've gotten in our digital economy, and listen, I've been blessed by technology. My career started at IBM and Silicon Graphics and business objects, and I've, I've been in tech most of my life, but this will never replace this. So get out of email, get out of the stinking text messages, and take, and by the way, I, I try to practice what I preach, right? Personal handwritten notes are on my desk, and we probably get out, I'll probably get out 20 plus of these out a week because it sets you apart from everybody else. It's something that I've heard so many people say they should do and so many people, so few people actually do. I've done it a few times, I've, I, but not nearly enough, I would say. That's Can I give your audience a quick tip? This might be useful. Yeah, absolutely. So I call it the rule of three. Number one, send it within three days of having met them. If you send it six months later, they're not gonna remember you, right? Mm -hmm. So send it within three days of having met them. 
no more than three sentences. Have you seen people who write the notes and then they draw an arrow and they got to write on back of the card and that's <laughs> not enough space. So they got to take an eight and a half by 11 page and fold it in quads and don't be one of those people. Nobody needs a dissertation, mm -hmm. three sentences. And as such shouldn't take you more than three minutes. I love it. So if Great. you do that and I have some in my car, I have some in my briefcase. If you stick to that rule of three, it's amazing how much easier it gets. Stamps are not that expensive. Last I checked, this is really worth it. And, um, and when you, you actually use a physical stamp again and you hand, hand write it, it sets you apart from everybody else. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a great way to do it. Um, so, uh, Maybe I should write you a, a handwritten thank you card for being I, on the show here. I gotta I'd go be personally cards. upset if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, especially since we discussed it, right? Right. Um, so, in your, what is, in your opinion, the number one mistake salespeople make when it comes to collaboration and co-creation? They revert back to what they know, which is a transaction. Uh, right. Uh, it, we've, as long as I've known, as long as I've been in sales and I'm dating myself, I used to have a lot more hair, Steve. I used to be a lot more <laughs> handsome. I used to have a lot more hair. They're not even turning gray. They're just leaving. Uh, <laughs> it's a problem. It's a problem. Right, it really is a problem. We all, we all face. <laughs> right. Um, so uh, as long as I've been in sales, I've been incented. I've been measured. I've been incented. I've been rewarded. I've been recognized for transactions. That's, uh, it's, it's great. You can't take your eye off the ball, right? We all have a nut. We all have a number. We all have quotas. Uh, the quota keeps getting bigger every year. You can't lose sight of that. But the minute you revert back to that and that becomes your comfort zone because it's what you know, you're going to lose the opportunity to co-create because the transaction and the heat of crap, I got to get to my number this week or this month is going to just kind of take over. So ideal if you have some air cover, boss, manager, that believes in you, that supports you in, you know what, this is not going to be a deal next week, but I'm going to keep, and, I, and I've always have some short-term, medium-term, long-term, small, medium, large deals in my pipeline. But anytime you can invest in the relationship and turn those transactions into transformations, into opportunities to really collaborate, I've always believed do the right things and the numbers will come. I promise the numbers will come. You just got to be very focused on how do, am I collaborating? Am I co-creating with the right people? I love it. Do you have any habits that you do every day or routines or rituals that, that uh, you believe enhance productivity? Absolutely. Let me again, let me give you audience. I like practical, pragmatic tips. And I, I, uh, I'm a big believer that we're all products of the advice we take. So let me say it again. We're all products of the advice we take. And I've been blessed by some incredible mentors who have driven this into me. One mentor in particular, a guy named Alan Weiss, uh, drove into me what, what he calls the SUG list, S-U-G, to this day, and this has been 10 plus years going on, every morning before I open up email, before I said to do anything else, I make a daily SUG list. So S is what is so serious that if I don't do it today, it's going to hurt me. It's typically my clients, it's typically my prospects, it's proposals, it's things I got to get out, right? We got to deliver on existing commitments. You is what is so urgent. If I don't do it, it's going to become serious and hurt me. So it's got to be next in line. G is growth. G is nice to have. G is, you know, you can't ignore growth. By the same token, it's silly to work on growth when the house is burning down. So I make a list, no more than one page, no more than three to five in each of those buckets. And by end of the day, before I leave my desk or my office, I make sure at least I've covered all the serious, I've covered most of the urgent, and I've gotten even to one or two of the growth. But that SUG list can really help you stay focused on your biggest asset and enemy, which is your time. Um, I Taking some great notes here on, on this. this is I, I charge $5 per good idea, 10 bucks <laughs> if you actually do something with it. All right, I, I, I'll, have to, I'll have to stick a check in with my thinking card right here. Um, <laughs> what, uh, what are, this is great stuff. What, what, are, what are some other practical tips that you have? Um, I, 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 uh, I, again, I got I to gotta put a plug in. Since you're sending me a check, I got to put a plug in for your technology because – for years, I had a really large geography, or, or even now, 
I got to tell you, I, I love my bed. I love my wife. I don't want to go across town for just one meeting, much less across the country. So I'm a huge believer of, and again, an old sales manager drove into me. If you genuinely believe as a salesperson, your biggest asset and your enemy is time. I want to maximize that time. So one specific example for you, I spoke in Dubai. I'm not going to Dubai for one event. A, out of my own pocket, I went early. I stayed after. I got on LinkedIn and I scheduled 14 meetings in three days in Dubai, none of whom I'd ever spoken to any of those people. So get very specific. My favorite day is five, seven meetings in a day. I've got my calendar, physical calendar of three months in front of me. I can tell you that April 23, 24, 25, 26, I'm going to be in these four cities. I start now. People are busy. So get on the stick, map out your plans, map out your routes, map out what's the most efficient and effective path for me to really maximize my time. I get up five in the morning. I, you know, by the time I work out, shower, shave, clean up, I'm at my desk by 6, 6.30. If family's here, if I'm in town, I have breakfast with them, but I make it a productive day. And when my light is on an auto timer, goes off, um, you know, I'm going and spend quality time with the family. And then I come back after to go to bed, but really maximize my time and be efficient, whether I'm traveling, whether I'm on the road, whether I'm going to go see somebody. Fantastic advice. Um, well, I always think it's fantastic advice when people tell other people that they should be using my product badger. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm biased, so don't, don't listen to me. <laughs> um, so uh, what, what, uh, what, what is, what would be your top piece of advice that you would give uh, or top thoughts to keep top of mind that yeah. you would give to our listeners, you know, sales managers, uh, oh, well, uh, sales managers of outside sales teams, people yep. who are actually in the field, field salespeople. What, what, would, yep. you, what would you say to them? I'm going to reiterate again what a mentor drove into me. And he said back then, there's money in those notes. There's money in these podcasts. There's money in these conversations. There's money in these lessons. There's none of us have all the answers, right? And again, dad drove into me. Life is too short to make all the mistakes yourself. Stop it, right? You're not helping yourself. You got to learn from other people's experiences. So I'm a huge believer and I hope your audience doesn't just passively. And that's one of the challenges of podcast, right? I can passively listen when I work out in the car, whatever, Make the time, pull over, right? Make the time to take some notes. Make the time to create an action list for yourself. And none of these ideas, I know this stuff. I don't need to hear myself talk. Take some of these ideas and integrate them. Implement them into your day. Implement them into what you're doing and how you're doing it. You know what? Tomorrow, I'm going to make a sug list. Tomorrow, I'm going to take all these stinking business cards that are on my desk and I'm going to scan them in and I'm going to follow up with a personal handwritten note. But here's what I hope your audience will hear. The 1% rule says improve by 1% a day and in 70 days, you're twice as good. This, Steve, this isn't about some exponential tomorrow I'm a superhero. This is about how am I better off? What's the one thing, what's the 1% I can improve tomorrow that's going to make me better than I was today? And if your audience sticks to that one simple rule, improve by 1% a day, in 70 days, they're twice as good. The numbers are going to grow. The deals are going to go. The relationships are going to grow. And by the way, the relationships, I'm actually, I, I might be the antichrist on this podcast. You ready? I'm ready. <laughs> I, I, don't want, I don't want more clients. I actually want to go deeper and wider in my existing clients. I want to become more impactful in their business. I want to create such a barrier of entry for others that a 5 or 10 or 20% or 50% discount won't matter to my clients because I've built such a strategic, such a co-created relationship with them. Again, it might be crazy talk, but all the evidence shows that efficiency, effectiveness of how you sell is as critical as casting a massive net to figure out what you bring back in it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and I can relate to that. I mean, I, I've got a team of people that work on 
helping our existing customers, you know, get more out of the product and spread it to other areas of their organization. Um, Cause a lot of times you'll have like the Western region using us and the Eastern region isn't or something, but then I've got another team of people that are out there hunting for new business and, and uh, you know, doing the, doing more of the, the street pounding sales, finding new customers who aren't using us at all. So I'm also, I'm also saddened in some ways that, that we don't train enough hunters. We don't invest in taking bright, energetic, ambitious, driven kids out mm -hmm. of schools and really teach them how to hunt. It is becoming a lost art. Oh, a lot of I sales, so agree. A lot of sales comp plans, and I'm saying this respectfully on somebody who's been selling for 30 years, they're so base heavy. I, I interviewed a woman yesterday who's so base heavy, she's got no incentive to go out there and hustle. And that's not her fault. That's the organization's fault of you're not creating that carrot, that upside potential. Salespeople, I also believe, should be the highest paid people in the company. Nothing happens until somebody somewhere sells something, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, but comp plans that aren't in sending the right behaviors are breeding a whole lot of farmers. God bless them. I, I just, I don't want to be one. And I'm saddened that we're losing that hunting mindset, that hunting mentality. Well, and I, and I think if, you know, a key, a key thing to managing sales teams, right, is you've got to separate your hunter, hunters and your farmers. Both hunting and farming is really important. I mean, often a lot of a company's money is coming, the, the revenue that's coming in the door is from sure. farming, sure. But, but the company's future is in the hunting. And, and so you've got, to, you've got to have both. And it's hard as a sales rep, I believe, to do both well. It's hard to be focused on uh, managing your existing customer base and doing a great, uh, doing them right. If you uh -huh. are also charged with going right. out and new comp new, new logos and winning new business. I think you love want, it. You love it. Separate those two parts of the organization. I think. Yeah. Love it. Agree. My, my very paint broad paintbrush litmus test has always been 60% repeat 40 net new. I don't know of an organization that doesn't need net new business by the same token if a whole bunch of it is repeat business, you're going you're gonna to get complacent because you're not out there sharpening your skills, mm -hmm. sharpening. And by the way, the best sales organizations I continue to meet have adapted the way they sell to the way their customers buy. So if I understand, and I wrote in Co-Create book, the customer experience journey is this infinity loop. So if you understand that they evaluate, they consider their options, they look at kind of what they need, they come back to evaluation, they buy, they use, they come back to evaluation, and you create on-ramps for them, right? And you engage them at the time of their need and on the device of their choice, right? It, it really helps create those opportunities. But back to your comment about balancing hunting and farming, I try to balance my relationships because there are a lot more opportunities for you to hunt, even in your existing clients. Think of cross divisions, cross geographies, different business units, different business leaders. By the way, the revolving door of client executives that come and go, right? That always creates opportunities for you to go back in. By the same token, evolve your value, right? How do, it's not our customers' jobs to buy from us. It's our jobs to engage and influence them. So do you have a broad enough portfolio to be able to bring different value proposition to different types of buyers at different times of their need? If not, you're pigeonholing yourself. You're painting yourself in a corner that says, once you buy my widget or my product or solution, thanks very much, we're done until either that thing dies or you need another one. And I've just never believed in that. Sales teams and the best sales organizations need a portfolio to be able to go in with and ideally offer a broad you know, solutions, broad portfolio of offerings. We're trying to do it ourselves. Um, as a final takeaway, what should the field salespeople listening today do as a first step to get started with co-creation? Yeah, I'm a huge believer of introspection. Steve, we don't make enough time to think. So, and I'm respectful of your family time and your personal time, um, but that, you know, nine to five probably isn't the best time to do that, but find some quiet time. I, I ride motorcycles, right? So when I put that earplug in and my helmet on, Nobody's texting me, nobody's calling, nobody's tugging at me. It's a phenomenal time to think. Use that time to think, and I specifically, I want you to think about two things. What are your biggest strengths that you can build on? What are your weaknesses? What are your 
areas that are not a good use of your time that ideally you find ways to shore up through others. I've never believed in you or me or anybody else. Work, working on that weakness is really a, a, a good investment. I want to I want to continue to build on the strength. Can I do accounting? Yes. Do I have any business doing expense reports? Oh, hell no, right? So I'd rather pay somebody, a virtual assistant, or somebody to, here are my receipts, here's the tool, here's whatever, do that part on my behalf so I can focus on, you know, really nurturing and sustaining and relating and really testing my relationships because that's where my business is going to come from. So whether you're a, you know, you're a sales rep by yourself or you're a sales manager, focus on the strengths that we can build on and the weaknesses that we can shore up through others or minimize or how do we help them really leverage their biggest asset, which is on calls with clients, in front of clients, engaging current and prospective clients. Fantastic. Well, we, we've covered a ton of material here. I'm going to do my best to summarize it in a minute or two here so everyone that's driving can, uh, can you know, kind of have, hear it twice because I can't take notes. So I'll jump in. Uh, so D David was inspired to write Co-Create by working with a whole bunch of companies and identifying that there were key challenges across all these different companies that they were struggling to remain relevant. David saw a problem with the company's struggle, the, all these companies struggle to maintain value over time as the relationship progressed. Um, there's an opportunity to drive growth and to create value by, by, by co-creation working with adjacent products or ideas that work with your existing solution and creating these with the customer to build the value over time, uh, maintain a, a valuable relationship with that customer over time. Salespeople can learn to use uh, co-creation by listening louder. And that means listening to really understand. Make sure you listen for what they're trying to do and, and why they're trying to do it. Invite prospects and customers into the ultimate solution. Understand what they're really looking for. Stop thinking like you have all the answers going into the meeting. Learn, instead, learn to be naturally inquisitive. Be curious. Such an important characteristic for salespeople is curiosity. There are, there are three types of relationships. So there's personal relationships, there's functional relationships. So you know, the, the people that we put up with because we have to, you know, maybe that, you know, annoying coworker or, or you know, your, your mother-in-law. Um, <laughs> not everyone's mother-in-law, some are great. <laughs> um, uh, strategic, strategic relationships are the, uh, are the third type of relationship. And, and this is where you're, you're able to work together to elevate your thinking. Um, these strategic relationships are people who can accelerate your ability to get things done. Co-creating allows you to build these relationships and work with these people in a way that you demonstrate that you have a vested interest in their outcome. Uh, the difference between collaboration and co-creation is that collaboration can often fail because a lack of commitment and and just working across uh, and just working to parallel success. Um, you know, you, you, uh, you've got a co-creation co-creation's goal is really to come together by a common vision or a common enemy and work with someone else towards the same end result. Uh, the key is to enter intertwine the success. Sales managers and leaders can help salespeople with co-creation by modeling the right behavior, by enabling the sales team to lead with relationships and collaboration instead of thinking about them after the fact, and by celebrating sales successes that come out of listening and working with others to co-create. Salespeople need to remember to not make every sale a transaction. 
salespeople need to work with people to co-create and create unique value. David believes that you, you really are the advice that you take. Uh, and, and David recommends making a sug list every day, make an action list of the serious, urgent, and growth items you need to tackle each day in order to keep improving. As a first step to co-creating, save some time today for introspection, to think about the strengths that you have and the weaknesses that you can work on, especially leveraging others to, to do the things that you're weak at for you, um, and, and work with others to build these co-creating relationships. So, David, I really uh, so many cool so many cool thoughts that I, I that I've got here um, out of this. This is really great. Uh, my, my pleasure. It's been it's been it's been a ton of fun. So, and, and misery likes company. So I love being around salespeople and <laughs> comparing notes of of uh, challenging. Let's just put it that way: challenging prospects and customers. We all work with on a daily basis. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, that's that's the name of the game. Where, where can where can our listeners read more about your work and where can they reach out to you? Sure. So obviously I'm on LinkedIn and, and the last name is just David Noor, N-O-U-R. But you can also go to our website, which is just N-O-U-R group.com. That's, uh, that's our team. We're, we're a painter's house always needs painting. We're in the process of also updating our own website and adding more of the team and and uh, adding a broader portfolio of offering to it. But again, N-O-U-R, norgroup.com is the best place to, to find us. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Insta. Uh, those are all great, uh, great places. And it's typically just my, my handle is typically my name. So if you just Google my name, that's another good way to find my books. Find We have a YouTube channel with several hundred videos in it. So those are all great ways for, uh, we have a newsletter you can subscribe to. So that's a great way for your listeners to learn more about me and my work. Fantastic. Well, this has been a great episode of the Outside Sales Talk. If you can think of any other sales reps that would benefit from learning this stuff that we've talked about today, share the love and, and forward this to them. Take care until next time, everybody. Bye.